Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Be sure to follow us, by the way, on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash UNC knowledge. Twitter.com slash UNC knowledge. A classicist and military historian, Victor Davis Hanson is a fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. He's the author of many books, including recently, A War Like No Other, How the Athenians and Spartans Fought the Peloponnesian War. Robert Baer spent 20 years in the Central Intelligence Agency as a field officer covering the Middle East. Mr. Baer is now a journalist and author. His latest book, The Devil We Know, Dealing with the New Iranian Superpower. Victor, Bob, thank you for joining us. Thanks. Segment one, will Iran or won't it? An October report by the International Atomic Energy Agency, quote, Iran has sufficient information to design and produce a workable implosion nuclear device, close quote. Do you buy that? Iran is now capable of producing nuclear weapons? Oh, I think absolutely. No, I think without any doubt. Oh, without any doubt. I think they're very close. They could move very quickly on this. Uh, we haven't even seen the beginning of their programs, their covert capacity uh, to pick stuff up in Eastern Europe, in Russia. Um, they could move very quickly if they wanted to. Victor, you buy that as well. Yeah, I think the key word was a nuclear weapon because I don't know how much enriched uranium and what quality it is that would allow them to produce a series of weapons. Remember the United States after the Nagasaki bomb really didn't have a, a, an arsenal of atomic weapons for six months. So I, I don't know, they might get one or they might get perhaps two, but I think that's why it's for so important that we watch these deals where they're offering to have p other outside people, France or Russia, enrich in uranium, because I think they're having a little bit of problems uh -huh. to get a series can of I, weapons. Can I, question, who knows what? You're a former CIA operative, you're a military historian. How do you form your opinions about what's actually going on? You're doing more than reading the New York Times. Mm -hmm. I think everybody... In other words, can you form really good opinions yes, yes. on what's publicly available in information? I think you can, and I think... I think you can. You can you project. Can. I mean, okay. you know, I had the advantage of, of seeing classified reporting on Iran, mm -hmm. and frankly, it wasn't good. Mm -hmm. um, We've been out of that country since 79. How recently did you see? Until December 97 when I left the CIA. Right. I followed it fairly closely as right. fr from the sidelines. It's not very good, and the Iranians are very good at procuring um, banned materials very easily, and they're very smart people, and they are capable of making bomb, and they have been going back to the really the 70s. What the important thing is they've chosen not to, and that's really one of the key right. questions. Let me quote you, Bob. You write in The Devil We Know, quote, right now the Iranians don't need a nuclear bomb. The Iranians are too smart to risk the gains they've made in Iraq and Lebanon by forcing the issue. So they have the ability to produce a nuclear weapon. They could do so quickly, but they won't. I think they're buying time. They're, tr they're trying to remain a radical revolutionary power and yet get themselves at the international negotiating table. And the way to do this is keep on letting information out about their bomb, saying they're going to do it, backing off, and they are trying to work their way, I don't think they're going to make it, into the G20 by this, by simply forcing our hands. That's my opinion. Victor, what do you think they're up to? Oh, I, I think they're... It depends on what Iran we look at. The present-day Iran, I think that they feel that the Iraqi democracy didn't implode like they thought it would, and because you of mean its, in the, after this recent election, exactly, and the, and they a thought lot they were of, about to lose their the regime thought it was about to get yeah, overturned. I, 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 well, I think that the idea that Iraq is at next door and it's actually working in somewhat stable fashion, and then you have a large dissident movement within Iran, and then Lebanon didn't become just entirely a Hezbollah enclave, and that Lebanon still survived as a quasi-constitutional state, and their way of looking, Manichaean way of looking at the world, they, we say, well, they're very powerful, and they won, and Iraq empowered, but in their way of thinking, I think they look at Lebanon, they look at the Sunni states that are actually more favorable to Israel stealthily than they are Iran, they look at what's going on in Iraq, and they think, my gosh, 
we are in an unstable position and maybe this Russian route and a bomb or two will allow us to do what Pakistan has done, give us some autonomy. I don't think that they feel that they're in a very stable position. I don't think they are either. I think the regime is shaky. I think it's give me a lot of give, Who actually runs Iran? We've got a population of about 70 million people yeah. and a very, I was going to say, a strange form of government because it's so, at least as far as I'm aware, it's dissimilar to any, certainly it has no uh, parallel in, in the West, and as far as I'm aware, it doesn't really have any parallel elsewhere in the Muslim world. This strange theocracy, you've got an elected president, a legis an elective leg elected legislator elected from slates approved by the, but the mullahs seem to have enormous... How, that, that changed on the 12th of June. Uh, you know, I, I, I think this is a bit of an exaggeration, but there was a military coup. And the country is being run by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Which um, is about 100,000 strong, is that right? It's a little bit more than that. But right. so you've got the besiege, which there is their reserves that came out in the street. And, and the, the problem and with the reserves it, are several million? Yeah, they can be several million. They can put okay. two million people in uniform very quickly. Um, but the besiege are volunteers, and they're being integrated into the Revolutionary Guards, fully integrated. But the point is... Uh, the commanders, and especially the new defense minister, came through what's called the Kutz Force, which has a long history of shedding blood, particularly American blood. Um, the Kutz Force was responsible for the two bombings in Argentina. It was responsible for blowing up the Marines in Beirut in 83 and on and on. Now, now that these people are fully in control and have made Rafsanjani back down, as well as Karubi, who ran for... Um, elections this time, and Musavi is what are these people going to do? Are they reformed revolutionaries or are they still radicals? And that I don't, uh, you know, we don't know yet so far. Okay, segment two. What does Tehran think it's doing? We've actually touched on this. Iran, slightly bigger than the state of Alaska, population about 70 million, religion, Shia Muslim, resources, vast deposits of oil and natural gas. Robert Baer in The Devil We Know, quote, what's critical to understand is that Iran today has an unshakable belief in its right to empire. It means to achieve this through proxy warfare and control over oil supplies. That's two sentences and two assertions. Let's take them one at a time. An unshakable belief in a right to empire. Do you, do you, want, do you, want, do you want me to say it in, in, in politically incorrect? Yeah, you please. They think they are superior, the Iranians do, to the Arabs. So there's an ethnic overlay it's here. It's huge. And it's, they look at the it's, ethnics it's as Bedouin, as backward, and they look at their civilization as more advanced in, than even the West. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll go through their, their old empires. They'll go through um, any number of things, and they think they're a superior culture. I think it's, it's, you know, we're talking about a people, and there's a certain amount of exaggeration. And they also look at the chaos around them. On Sunday, there was a bombing that killed 41 in Sistan province that was done by a suicide bomber. And they look at the mess in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, and they look at Iraq, the suicide bombings there, and they see a, a, uh, the barbarians at the gate. And they do not intend to let those barbarians cross the border. And if they have to become aggressive to stop the barbarians, which, which they look at, and again, this is an exaggeration. As soon as Muslims, they will. And they'll do it through proxies. They'll do it through irregular warfare, asymmetric warfare, if you like. The Persian proportion of the population of Iran itself 51%. is 51%. So, and the, it's a, remarkable how fragmented the remaining 49% is. You've got about 24% Azeri, as I recall, and everybody else is in single digits. There are a dozen other ethnic groups that are in single digits. They're sitting on a volcano. Yeah. So the 51% Persians say to themselves, we can control these people in our own borders. Why should we can control them in a wider empire too. Is that what you're saying? Oh, absolutely. When we it comes, know, when we it, know how to control them. When, when, when it comes to the Arabs, they can. When is the last time the Arabs in the Gulf fought a war? Uh, Never. And, and that's and because not modern history. Because they're not, they're not organized to do it. I, th I think... You're, you accept all this? More or less. I, I, I think that... the. The problem with Iran is that um, it's an imploding society. For, it has these minority problems. It has these rivalries. It's got now a constitutional system emerging in Iraq. It's got this problem in, in Lebanon. It's not liked by the Arab countries. It's got the Europeans in this Orwellian situation where they're on the right side of us now. Sarkozy pushing us. I never thought in my lifetime I would see an Iranian president lecture an American president. French about, president. Lecture. Excuse me, French president. But... 
I think what the problem is for us is that we got this regime in there that wants to tell the Muslim world that the Shia and the Persian, who had been the minority and less distinguished, are the real inheritors of Muslim supremacy and that they are the people who will deal with the Zionist entity and that they're willing, as Roth and Johnny said years ago, to lose a sizable number of their population. But to us, we think this is crazy, this is surreal. I think it is. I don't think they're serious. But 65 years after the Holocaust, you can't expect a small Jewish state, which is, as I think, I don't, I've never found the documentation of that statement, but someone, you know, the widely quoted one bomb state is, is what Iranian supposedly said about Israel, that it was a one bomb state. Meaning it would take one bomb to Yeah, I don't think that's Israel. quite true myself. A 20 kiloton bomb wouldn't destroy all of Israel. But nevertheless, if it's 65 years after the Holocaust, you can't expect the state here to sit there and just say to themselves, Ahmadinejad, Rothenjad, all these people are just trying to chest thump because they're Shia and they're Persian and they want to tell the Arab world they're the real tough Muslim. So that's what the problem is, that because in nuclear poker, lunacy is an advantage. And that's what they're trying to convey. And we, we think it's lunacy, but we don't know. Daniel Pipes, quote, Iran today is reminiscent of the Soviet Union in the 1970s. The regime is brutal and aggressive, but hollow. Bob? I don't think it's hollow. I mean, it's not hollow in the sense that you know, it's going to collapse like the Soviet Union. It's, it's, it, we shouldn't liken. We have Putin, as far as we can tell, because now Russia is free and people get in there and conduct public opinion polls. We view Putin as a very difficult, disagreeable character, but there's no doubt he commands the support of well over half the population of Russia. Does the regime in Iran command the support of a significant portion of the population? Oh, there, that we are not in a, a pre-revolutionary state in Iran. There's no signs of it. I think we're seeing... Uh, Tuck Ferry Sunni fundamentalism on the edges. I think we're seeing a threat coming in from Pakistan. There's going to be a lot more bombs going off, but there's no sign that well, there's going to be a velvet revolution or an, an insurgence by the Azeris would be key, for instance. Um, it, it, the state is too powerful, too brutal, and too capable of controlling Iran so, right now. I have a question here that was submitted by Twitter from somebody who calls himself UK Manchild. Strange name, but a good question. Should the United States have supported the protesters, the dissidents, in the uh, current, in the after effects of the current Iranian revolution? You're can, suggesting. Can I not. answer that? Yes, please. Look, you're, you, it let, sounds let, as though you're suggesting Obama got it about right. This was a look, long time to push. Karubi and Mousavi, give us a sentence on each of them. Were directly involved in blowing up the Marines in the U.S. Embassy in 1983. They have blood on their hands. These are not people that we can in any way trust. They have made it appear they've transformed themselves into some sort of green revolution, but they haven't. There is no alternative in Iran that we can identify that should come to power to replace Khamenei and Rafsanjani, that I can identify. Well, I think the question is, were all the million in people behind Mousavi? I think it was more like people who went out in the streets in 79 and said that they were for Khomeini, but they were for Bani Sadr or they were for a socialist type European state. So what I'm suggesting is maybe it would have been counterproductive for George Bush to do it, but this is part uh, to support the people in the street in Tehran. It would have been, it would have been it's tarred them with the Bush brush. But 53 percent of the Americans voted for Barack Obama because he was the, the promised transcendent candidate that appealed over the heads of governments and political leaders. So it seemed to me that he was in a very unique position of not supporting Mousavi, but saying to the Iranian people, we support your legitimate concerns over constitutional government and do a lot more rather than wait, wait, wait. What he, look, he ended up uh, resembling was an old style Jim Baker realist that was saying, let's see who wins. Whoever wins, if it's Tiananmen Square again, we do not want to be on the side of the losers. So it, it didn't look good. And uh, it sort of bothered our Sunni allies as well. And it bothered a lot of people in the world. And people like Barack Obama who talk about human rights and idealism and make fun of the old uh, ideological blinkers that we had, he, he, they shouldn't be on the wrong side of history. I, don't, I think Mus I agree with Robert. Mousavi's a thug. But the people who were in the streets who said that they were supported and were not thugs. Segment three, what is to be done? And what is to be done by the United States? So 
give we, me a... We have me. a big problem we haven't discussed, and that's Russia, because in Russia's ways of thinking, it's a win-win-win situation to encourage Iran to get the bomb, and we don't want to confront that. So we, we had this embarrassing situation with the quid pro quo of selling out the Poles and the Czechs for this non-existent help by Russia. If Russia, if well, they then get... You better back up and explain that. The Bush administration said we're going to put missile defenses in Poland yes. and the Czech Republic. The Obama administration has said, said, no, we're not. And, and it's not a question of whether it was wise or not. At this late point in the game, you had Eastern Europe go out on a limb. You should have supported them. Russia was never going to help you because any tension in the Gulf raises oil prices for both Russia and Iran. If Iran gets the bomb, it's going to be pointed westward or toward Israel. It's not going to be pointed toward Russia. And in the Russians' way of thinking, we're going to be the reg regional kingmaker. And if you have this rogue nation that's nuclear and you want it to be contained, we're going to rehab, refashion the 19... 70s, 60s Cold War role that we played in the Middle East, that you have to come to us to deal with our client. And anything that causes us problems, as we know, whatever they are, Putin's for. So this idea that we're going to ever cut a deal, we, we have to deal with the fact that Russia wants Iran to be nuclear and will go at great lengths to make sure it is. And it'll do the same thing to Israel and do the same thing to us that North Korea does to Japan. It's something. It's an irritant, and it's good if you're Putin. And this idea that he's the Russians are the new French. They yeah. will define themselves against. Oh, they're us. much worse. They're much worse. Than much the French, French have been but very you, positive right. in Iran. But he's right. Victor's right. It wouldn't. If you were the Russians, wouldn't you want to? You know, one drive up the price of oil. Right. If you want to pull the Russian economy out of this this recession that's going through, is drive up the price of oil. The hundred fifty dollars a barrel. They benefit from it, and they don't care what happens in the Gulf. They're not addicted to oil like we are. Two quotations. Former Vice President Dick Cheney, October 2007, quote, we will not allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon, close quote. Retired General John Abizade last year, quote, there are ways to live with a nuclear Iran, close quote. Is the attainment of a nuclear weapon by Iran, f or should it be, flatly unacceptable to the United States? Is that where you begin with American policy? Whatever else we do, we won't let them get that. The question is, what can we do about it if they make a bomb? What the Iranians have stated they will do, and I believe that they will, is if we attack their nuclear facilities, they will take out Saudi Arabia's major oil facilities with surface-to-surface -surface missiles. And Which that is would pretty be easy to cake. do. They yeah. could do that. We're talking about 10 million barrels instantly would be taken off markets, world markets. 17 million bar barrels of traded oil in the Gulf would be taken off, and we would be paying four to $500 for a gallon of gasoline. and are we as Americans, I'm talking about American people, prepared to go that far? And I'd say no. Victor? Most people who say that we can live with it, a nuclear Iran, uh, Iran point to Pakistan. But I think that there's two problems with that. Most of our problems in Afghanistan come from Pakistan. Right. And they otherwise wouldn't be there in some degree if Pakistan wasn't nuclear. And two, there's a billion-person nuclear India that contains Pakistan. We don't have a billion-person uh, nuclear rival of Iran that contain it uh, within the region. So it's a bad and a worse choice. Uh, but there are ways, I think, of preventing them from getting a series of bombs through uh, blockades, really strengthen sanctions, and we're not willing to do that because apparently the United States does not want to get in a situation in which oil prices increase, we offend Russia. There are ways to prevent them from getting a series of nuclear I weapons. I think there so are. So you think we need to prepare ourselves to live with at least a kind of North Korea size? No, I don't. Where they have four no. or five or six weapons? No, no. no. I think There's that, no way to prevent them from getting any? I think there... I think there is a way. I think if you to prevent them from getting yes, any at I all. I think that you could get the Europeans, the Indians, to immediately stop importing, um, exporting gas, refined gasoline inside. You could probably have some kind of blockade of the Persian Gulf. We're talking about very serious things that are acts of war, but they're not a act, physical act of war. But they would, they would put enough pressure on Iran and ostracize it. But and if we blockaded the Gulf, they wouldn't take out the Saudi oil? I don't know. That would be facilities. their call. We did it with Cuba, and uh, Russia had to make that call. The Cubans, uh, they backed down. I'd, I would be very... If you had an array of American ships that blocked it, uh, gasoline going in or you s going into Iran, or you blocked the importation of certain uh, military things or export of oil, it would be their call whether they wanted to attack an American ship. Let me, let, let me pursue the Abazid. There are ways to live with a nuclear Iran. This is a pretty good question from a Albert Fuchs by way of Facebook. Mutually assured destruction kept nuclear weapons from being used during the Cold War. Would Iran be as sensitive 
to nuclear deterrence, as was the Soviet Union? You know, that's a question I'd ask the Israelis, because they're really the key in this. Can Bibi Netanyahu live with a defense minister who really built Hezbollah and was behind the rocketing of Israel in, in 2006 in many ways? Can somebody, like my argument is they're more rational than they were, you know, in 1983 and 1984. Can they live with that argument and count on the Iranians not being suicidal? So I don't think it's really the answer is in Washington, it's in Tel Aviv, what they're going to do. So you just set up segment four, which is Israel. Israeli Defense Minister Ephraim Sne, in an October interview this month as we sit here taping this, quote, if no crippling sanctions are in place by Christmas, Israel will strike. Israel will strike. If we are left alone, we will act alone. Is that somebody getting out ahead of his prime minister? Is that the Israelis testing the Western response? This was in an interview with the Sunday Times in London. Or is that a statement of Israeli policy? Have they already answered the question? Sne is a friend of mine. Um, is he a crazy person or is this? No, a, he's not at all crazy. This he's is, not at all is, crazy. You know, he's, this he's, is a man who knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. He knows Iran. He knows politics. He's labor. Uh, he was labor. And if he says that Israel will attack, and he, he doubted they would a couple of years ago, they probably will. I think that when you have a 2% approval rating of Obama inside Israel, according to some polls, this might have, this was sort of what Israel did during the Bush administration, especially after that flawed 2006 estimate that Iran didn't, wasn't really getting the bomb. But now, I think when an Israeli high official says that they're going to do something, uh, we have to take it seriously, so I agree with Bob. And then there's another thing to remember. When you say, your point about the Obama's 2% approval rating in Israel is, this administration has almost no diplomatic leverage with Israel? Yes. Is that, that's the point and, you're making? And, and the second point, they don't believe that the United States is going to do anything. And they weren't sure about Bush. Second is that uh, I think it's... You buy both of those? Yeah. You do? Yeah. I think, She's right. I think also it, it's a, a little worrisome that uh, there are people in this administration. Uh, I'll give you three examples. Uh, the Samantha Power appointment, the failed Charles Fr uh, Freeman nomination, the pressure on the settlements, uh, Zizin, Dr. Zizinski's very Orwellian statement that who was an advisor to the Obama campaign, remember, on national security matters, that that we should shoot down... Brzezinski. Yes, is it Brzezinski, that we should shoot down uh, Israeli planes if they fly over American quote, occupied... Quote, Brzezinski. Zbigniew Brzezinski, in order to strike Iran, they, the Israelis, will have to fly over our airspace in Iraq. Are we just going to sit there and watch? We have to be serious about denying them that right. That means you go up and confront them. No one wishes for this, but it could be a liberty in reverse. Yeah, the liberty is the American I, worship that was. Yeah. So I, he's I, saying we should be willing yeah, to shoot I, I, down. I, I, don't, I don't know if he's, you know, he doesn't speak for the U.S. military. He doesn't speak necessarily for the Obama administration. But what I'm worried about is there's a large number of people in the Obama administration who don't see a constitutional democracy that's Western and it's very successful, tolerant, diverse society like Israel as exceptional in the region. It's just another uh, nation, no different, no better, no worse than Palestinians, no different, no worse than Syrians. And their way of thinking, if it's, it's a win-win situation. If Israel takes out the Iranians, then we say to the Israelis, oh my gosh, we deploy this preemptive unilateralism. We're no longer a strong ally and we win out of it. So I, I'm really worried because I see a Greek tragedy here where the the Israelis are going to have no good options, and they might feel that a second Holocaust, he denied the first one, and he's bragging about the second one to come. Yeah, and they might think this is the only thing we can do is try to do some response, and it will be messy, it'll be long, it won't necessarily be comprehensively successful, and then people in the United States, will, it'll, let, it'll open Israel up to say, you see, this, this, this is an ally that's an albatross around our neck. And this administration would like to. And the administration I think, wants distance. Yeah, I think from they Israel want to make anyway. it in. We want to be neutral in the way that Europe is toward Israel. This is what this administration wants. Qu question. Technically, militarily, what does Israel have the capacity to do <clears throat> to the Iranian nuclear program? It's limited. They've got some bunker busters. They could take out some sites underground. They could set it back for years. They may have to go back in 10 years from now or five years from now. Um, and I can understand, they're, 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 what they believe is if they can degrade their program, it's going to buy them time, it'll, con it'll convince the Iranians to back down, um, and they think that psychologically the Iranians will back down. I don't have that reading. I think that 
that the Iranians, this Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, is a cult. I think that under attack, they will attack in places we can't even imagine. In Iraq, in and Lebanon. the ordinary Western, the middle class population in Tehran will do They get what? sacrificed. It's too bad. You know, they, they have stated their deterrence doctrine is to strike back everywhere they can. So if Israel, and I think it's almost inevitable, well not inevitable, maybe it's a 50% chance, will attack, uh, we should expect the worst. And the worst is, give me three or four sentences on what happens the day after Israel attacks, uh, begins its attacks. Uh, is this a, is Dubai this gets hit, Abqaiq, Ras Tanura, uh, our supply lines in Iraq will be hit. And they can hit them. They can get across that border. And there are Iraqis that will do their bidding. Um, and we'll see a war in Lebanon. Uh, we're close to one now anyhow. And, and you will see this chaosistan, as McChrystal called it recently, uh, come into being. I think there's also something that's going on that's very, I haven't seen it in my lifetime, is the status of the Europeans. They were always the good cop and we were the bad cop. And we were always going to, yeah, the Arabs, from the Arab point of view. we were going to take care of business in the world and they were going to sort of say that we should have done soft power with the understanding that, that we were always there. Now we're not there. So this is why you have in the elites of are, are not with the people in Europe. They're worried about Obama. This is why Sarkozy keeps lecturing. He kept saying the sp centrifuges are spinning because if they get a two or three stage rocket, cities like Frankfurt, and now you're going to have a very bizarre situation like you do with North Korea and Japan. So a country like Germany, for example, that could build nuclear weapons like it does Mercedes, and they would work 4,000 probably in a year. They're going to sit there within missile range of a lunatic regime that says things like, we want a trade, we want this. And then the Europeans are going to be saying to us, you were supposed to, under our unspoken accords, make sure the Western system that emerged out of the Cold War was stable. And you did that very well in the Cold War. And now what are you going to do about this problem? And I think that's going to, that's going to be a narrative you're going to hear more and more from the British, the French, the Italians, uh, and the Germans that um, they can't really stand on the sidelines and say Bush did it or you guys are a bunch of cowboys because they got somebody for the first time in their memory who's markedly to the left of them. A winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. Exactly. And is a, is a, he's a committed un, United Nations internationalist and has broad appeal to their own publics in a pacifistic, utopian way. And these people who are sober, you know, we, we make fun of the Europeans, but they're very sober, judicious, real politique players. And they understand. They know their own interests. They know their own interests, and they know they do not want to be held up by a third-rate revolutionary theocracy on this matter of nuclear weapons. And same thing with Japan and North Korea. So either somebody takes care of North Korea or we're going to have uh, otherwise stable players saying we have to look to our own security. And that'll be a, a nightmare because we're going to have people go nuclear. We're going to have people, uh, we're going to redefine the relationship with the United States. Obama doesn't quite understand that whether he knew it or not, whether he gets a Nobel Prize, whether he wants to praise the United Nations human rights, he had a historic role to protect countries to act like utopians with the expectation that they didn't have to get their hands dirty and contain somebody, you know, not that far away from them. Segment five. Let's, let's just, well, let's call this segment the, the nightmare. Intel question. It's my understanding as a layman that all of this business of enriching uranium with spinning centrifuges, this is very skilled work. Wherever it's going on under the bunkers or around Iran, can we assume that Israel has already done everything it can to make being a physicist or a nuclear technician in Iran one of the most dangerous jobs in the world? Oh, they can't, they, can't, they, they can't solve this by covert action. They can't. They can't go kidnap scientists or assassinate them. It's, the program's too big. They're getting too much help from Russians, individual Russians at the very least. There's, this, this technology is easily, for the Iranians, we're very skilled people. I mean, they're, they're, they've made advances in nanotechnology and other fields that, that have surprised us. The scientific us. establishment there yeah, is Yeah, it's serious, very good. These serious. people are smart people. Um, that's, you know, isolated attacks like this is not going to do it. There is no easy solution to Iran's nuclear bomb. And we also haven't talked about the arms race in the Gulf. If you're Saudi Arabia, that's the huge divide in the Middle East, the Shia-Sunni divide. I would want a bomb if they get one. And then where does that lead to? And Mubarak has said he wants a bomb, or they've at least made noises about it. You know, I spent too much time in the Middle East to trust all these people with nuclear bombs. I mean, that's, I don't say that from a 
in, in a prejudice, but it's it, a region is volatile and nuclearized is very See, bad. I think another thing we don't talk about, we talk about the bomb, but we don't talk, the bomb is not the problem. The bomb is an expression of a particular worldview. We don't, we sleep tonight with Britain with a bomb, with France with a bomb, and to be frank with Israel, it's a constitutional state with a bomb. We don't sleep very well with China. We sleep much better with India, the bomb, than Pakistan. So it's the type of government, and when you don't have a non-constitutional, non-consensual, non-democratic government, now they can change. Uh, but I wouldn't worry about Japan that much with a bomb. I worry about China. I worry about North Korea. And the problem in the Middle East is there's not many people there that you, as Bob said, you would want to have a bomb. Israel is it. Well, come on, the borders aren't still, you know, since the Ottoman times. They're still disputed. They're still in and the, and the sectarian violence, which we don't under, begin to understand. And that's what scares me. And that goes on me. all the time. Yeah. Yeah, and we are going to be collateral damage even in this. Even enriched uranium. So they were enriching U-235. And maybe it's not the great, greatest weapons grade. Maybe they're sneaking it out to Russia under some phony program where Russia is going to use it, uh, enrich it in a different way, but really is helping them get a purity that they need for two or three You think bombs. it may be going back and forth? Yeah, I do. I really Russia. do. I think that's a, that we fell for that trap by saying that we'll let the Russians monitor it, so make sure it's for peaceful purposes when it may be a way of getting uh, not quite uh, good enough for your enriched uranium, even better. But all that being said, you can make a dirty bomb. You can get enriched uranium. You can pack it into a suicide bomber. You can walk into a Tel Aviv uh, government office. Or you can go into Lebanon. Or you can go to the United States and go into the stock market. And it, that, it's not going to do a lot of damage, but psychologically it's going to say this is contaminated. I, this is let's, radioactive. Let's, 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 let's close out the program with a few minutes remaining by placing ourselves in two situation rooms. First, we're in Israel. And we're advising the prime minister and your friend, the defense minister. And they've listened to everything that's been said so far. And I'll sum up as follows. On the one hand, if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, it's an existential threat to the state of Israel. We've said since Ben-Gurion that we will not permit that to happen. On the other hand, all we can do is buy ourselves time. And buy ourselves time for what? The administration in the United States would use an attack by us on Iran to put distance between us, the United States and Israel. Iranian public opinion, to the extent that it matters at all, would swing hard against us. Every one of our neighboring regimes, whatever they said in private, would feel required to denounce us in public. The Europeans would scarcely come to our aid and wouldn't be able to extend us any meaningful aid, even if they did. Buy us time for what? What do you advise Benjamin Netanyahu to do? If I'm an Israeli and I look at Iran's record vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians in Lebanon and the leadership that's come to power on 12 June, if I'm an Israeli, not as American, I'd say we somehow have to knock Iran down a notch. The Americans aren't going to do it. We're going to have to do it. And I think that's the decision. Not necessarily attacking the nuclear program. Just in general. I mean, we, need we, are, we, are, we are forgetting that the, 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 the Palestinian Authority now is under attack by Hamas, which, which is, is a looks client to, of Iran. which is a client of Iran, and, and Hezbollah is a client of Iran, and they are getting stronger by the day, and I think you can make that argument very well. We have to do something now, or we're going to be surrounded. What if Egypt falls next in the succession, where the sun comes in, but some pro-Iranian military faction comes in? I mean, the, the numbers are against Israel, so they're looking at it differently. And Gil Gaff, the nuclear Bob, weapon... Bob Baer advises the Prime Minister of Israel, you must act. Well, he's going to have to agree? act. I agree. And with the question, the $64,000 question is at what point will it, the point of no return come? But I think what they're going to have... You mean in the development of the nuclear... Yeah, they're going to have We're to not make, there yet? Not quite. We're going to have... Six uh, months? Six months, a year. But... What they have to do is, and that's why you're seeing Netanyahu go to weird places like Russia and Europe, they're going to have to assume that the United States is not the situation where it was in the past as a strong, protective, uh, paternal ally. And they're going to have to cut a deal. They're going to have to say to the Russians, we're going to have to do this. We want. What are you going to do about it? They're going to have to go to have outreach to the Saudis, to the Egyptians. They're going to have to talk to the Europeans, the French and Germans. And they're not going to get a coalition, but they're going to have to have a framework of all these parties and prevent and say to them, this is going to happen and what are you going to do about it? Not yes. that they're going to, and I think they're going to find a, a very ambiguous response. It's not going to say, don't do that. They're going to hear something like, well, we're not going to move on you. We're not going to oppose you, but we're going to criticize you in the media. Last question. Now we're in the Situation Room in the West Wing of the White House. 
everybody, including President Obama, has heard everything we've said in this program. To sum it up, the Israelis will, with a better than 50% probability, strike. What do you advise President Obama to do about that? About the Israeli strike? Well, to, yeah. what should he do about Iran, and what should he do about the Israeli strike? I have to, we, we're, time, yes. we need to keep I would it have a graduated response. First of all, I would say on this... To point, Iran. Yes, he said in July that by the time of the G20 summit, you're going to face consequences. Then the G20 summit and said, and he says, you're going to face consequences on October 1st when the direct talks have been. And then the direct talks have been. And then he said, this is the third time he said it. It doesn't do any good. He's going to have to say to his team, we're going to tell them we're going to stop the gasoline export into Iran. And then we're going to say we're going to have a blockade or san tough sanctions and then blockade. But they have to have deadlines, and they're not going to be deadlines like health care is going to be passed by the August recess or get out action. of Iraq by March The time for talking has passed. Yes. The United have, States must act. So they have to establish, and I'm not, I'm not an expert, but they have to find out what this graduated response is. Sanctions, blockades, uh, stopping export, and then the final red line is up here at about a year, and that's to do something. And then they're going to have to dis discuss it. And the, the problem is that this, we have a president who's been, who likes to be liked. He's charismatic. He's never been in a situation where when he's confronted with a very bad choice and a worse choice, and whatever choice he makes, people like us are going to criticize him perhaps. He's not going to be liked. His and whenever that situation... approval rating will drop Exactly. And every time he's been in that situation, we're seeing it now in Afghanistan, he votes present. That's what worries me. And with regard to Israel, briefly, what should the this, what should President Obama do? What Obama should be, do is he should, in diplomatic channels, help Israel prepare the, uh, appeal to the self-interest of people in the region, the Russians, the Europeans, and say, you know what, we don't like what they're doing if they're going to do it. If we did what I just pr outlined earlier, they would, Israel would not have to do it. You're, after all, just one last statement. Sure. This is 65 years after the Holocaust. My God, we're talking about six million people were executed why the world watched. And now we've got a person who's promising to do that again, and we're not doing it. And nobody's talking about it. And we're, this is just insane. Anybody reads something like Martin Gilbert, the Second World War, all he writes about is how the worlds didn't do anything, why they, the Wehrmacht went in and they just killed six million people. We got a guy who's saying that this didn't happen. He'd like it to happen again if it did happen. And we, this is insane. It's absolutely insane. Bob, what should President Obama do about Iran? Same two questions to you. I think that What's he should open a back channel right now to the real power, which is Khamenei and his son, and about five generals, and sit down at the table. You talk about Jim Baker, yeah. pragmatist. Sit down and see if there's any chance of a grand bargain. You send Holbrook over? You send a serious deal maker? Jim Baker. You send Jim Baker. Jim Baker, yeah. What do you give up, though, for them to quit? Um, that would be the question. What would they want? I mean, would, would it be the, a, a Resolution 242? Would it be something on Lebanon? Or would it be something on Iraq? Okay. And we have, we have, we have. If there's not interest, a, you said that their interest, it's, at it's one level, their interest is stability in their own region. They see themselves surrounded by lunatics, yep. and they want stability. And, and look, and we, we could, could cut we, that deal. We could right? cut. We could cut that deal. We could just turn over Afghanistan to the Taliban. Who's going to suffer first? Is not us. It's going to be the Iranians. And we do have. And it's not the embargo. They need. They need oil equipment. They need all sorts of things. They got a population seventy-one million, thirty percent unemployment. They need a lot of things. And you know, we can carry on this Cold War. We can strike their nuclear facilities. Hope nothing goes on. But we really need to go in there and open up an American president's got to take the risk of doing that and failing because I think at the end of the day, the, the, an embargo and sanctions could bring Iran down, but it could also create chaos or something that would look like World War III. And how do you advise President Obama to behave toward Israel? We have to reassure the Israelis. Look, the, we are attached at the hip with the Israelis. We simply can't tell them. I mean, look, let, let's let things go on as they are, and well, let's count for, you know, let's, let's hope for the best. That's not going to work with the Israelis. Uh, and we cannot stop their bombing of Iran. What's a commander going to do in Iraq? Say, you know, I've seen 20 F-16s coming this way. What should I do? If we have about four minutes before, you know, before they're crossing the border, there's, you can't stop them. So we need to get in a position to, that the Israelis are not thinking they're going to be destroyed. Last question. You get about six words apiece on this. Probability that the Israelis do strike within the 
by the end of the first quarter of next, by March of next year? Uh, 49 percent. Victor? I'd say 50-50. That's a cheerless note on which to end, <laughs> but uh, one worth pondering. Victor okay. Davis Hanson, Bob Baer, the author of The Devil We Know, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution. Thanks for joining us.